Several mosques in France face closure as part of a crackdown, what officials call a separatism. The government says it's to protect the nation's secular values, but some Muslims feel they're under attack. So how can this be resolved? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Imran Khan. The French government stepping up its crackdown on what it's calling religious separatism. 76 mosques are being inspected nationwide. They'll be closed if they're found to be a security threat. It's President Emmanuel Macron's latest response to a number of recent attacks that he's blamed on radical Islam. Islamic organizations accused of inciting hatred have been raided and closed. And Macron is pushing for imams to register and agree to a charter of republican values. But his government denies it's deliberately targeting the Muslim community. There are 2,600 Islamic places of worship in France. When you consider 76 out of 2,600, we're far from so-called widespread radicalization. But there are some very concentrated places of worship that are clearly anti-Republican, where imams are followed by intelligence services, where the discourse runs counter to our values, such as equality between men and women, and where there's hatred of Jews, Catholics and France, as well as dubious sources of financing. President Emmanuel Macron's response to the crisis has created tensions with the Muslim community. In early October, he said in a speech that Islam is in crisis around the world. He then laid out plans to tackle what he called radicalism. Two weeks later, a French teacher was beheaded after he showed cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad during a lesson on freedom of speech. Macron defended the magazine Charlie Hebdo for republishing those same cartoons. Muslims in several countries protested and began boycotting French products. And on October 29, three people were killed during a stabbing at a church in Nice. Macron called it an Islamist terror attack. Let's introduce our panel in Paris. Yasser Lawati, head of the Justice and Liberties for All Committee in London. Philippe Malier, Professor of French and European Politics at the University College London. And in the Moroccan city of Ifran, Nizar Massari, Associate Professor of International Studies at al Ikhwan University. A warm welcome to you all. I'd like to begin in Paris with Yasser Louati. One of the things that is confusing to somebody who doesn't really understand uh, the internal workings of France is that instead of strengthening existing anti-terrorism laws and make this about a policing issue, say, for example, something that they did in Great Britain, this law seems to be about protecting the, na the values of the republic, the idea of secularism. I don't understand why the values of the republic are need protecting in this way. Can you just explain what's going on here? Well, it makes no sense uh, just the way the government is holding the first victims of terrorism abroad, i.e. Muslims, as the suspect community at home, without any connection to France's disastrous policies abroad and at home. And to answer your question, when we speak of French values, this is a, you know, a loose term. What are we really talking about? If you're talking about the uh, motto of the Republic, liberté, égalité, and uh, fraternity, well, in that case, where the freedom where Muslims lose their religious freedoms and can't organize as communities like any other community in France, where is equality when Muslims are on, on, uh, facing structural discrimination? And what's the connection between protecting French values and uh, fighting terrorism? Now, of course, it's a smokescreen. Emmanuel Macron wants to go hunt uh, uh, on the far right uh, in electoral land. He wants to be to position himself as the protector of the nation, but he's just not, not answering the question, why is France getting attacked multiple times and why the government keeps failing to prevent these attacks despite having all the measures he asked for to prevent uh, terrorism? Now, the and the last point, if I may, uh, I don't think Emmanuel Macron, who's got his government, a man being investigated for rape, for rape and sexual harassment, can come to us and speak of you know French values when his own cabinet is filled of people being under investigation for conflict of interest, corruption charges, and even for lying under oath. Let me bring in uh, Philippe Malier here in London. Philippe, uh, once again, in the UK, 
when there was a problem with terrorism, eventually uh, the communities had to be enlisted into the fight. It did take a very long time, particularly the most famous case is the Finsbury Park Mosque, which eventually was uh, a, taken over by people from the community and all the, the extremist elements were kicked out. Is France following a similar method here or is this something that's a bit more extreme, to use that word? I think on the face of it, and you have to be very cautious because this new bill is under uh, preparation only and is going to be put to the uh, Council of Ministers next week only. But if, if you look at one of the provisions, it would seem that, yes, uh, there is, according to the government, a kind of threat in different various places and mosques in France. And those places would be under threat, i.e. Over, being overtaken, say, by a radical Islamist. That remains to be seen because part of the problem in this national discussion is that there's very little evidence put forward by the government to really substantiate its claims as to why there, there is actually a, a threat or not. But, but let's assume there is a threat. I, I, I'm also astonished that in order to combat terrorism, and, and there is indeed terrorist threats, uh, one should ask, you know, the overall population, and, and, and we know when we say the overall population, in fact, we are targeting, they are targeting indeed the Muslim population, why one should ask them to adhere to so-called Republican values, which are very loosely defined, why is that? In what way is it going really to make any difference in the fight against terrorism? So that's really a big, really puzzling. And I think in France, when uh, this debate is being uh, uh, is, is happening, you know, a lot of people also can't understand. So the conclusion which can be drawn uh, at this stage is that probably the government is pushing that kind of thing forward for political reasons. It's not really to fight terrorism, but it's for political gains. But Yasser Luati in Paris, this could backfire if it alienates the Muslim community. The Muslim community are key to stopping these attacks because they are the ones who are in those mosques. They can see that behaviour early. They can see criminality quicker than most. They risk, the France risks alienating those people, doesn't it? Well, who knows best than Muslims themselves when Islam is being hijacked by terrorists? Uh, in 2014, uh, there was a you know, leaked report from domestic intelligence called the Juno Report. And that report asked the government to stop with this repressive, resp uh, this repression-based uh, strategy and to reach out to communities and bring them to the table to find solutions and have a permanent dialogue and atmosphere of trust. This is not happening today. And if the government says, you know, they want to crack down organizations uh, of the accusation of separatism, first, there is no, uh, no definition of separatism or radicalization. The second point, all studies show that radicalization takes place outside of the mosques, outside of the organized communities, but in jails, online, and in places where uh, uh, communities have no really in, uh, no real direct involvement. Now, Emmanuel Macron does not want to solve the issue, and he does not care whether he's alienating Muslims or not. When, when we see, for example, that yesterday alone, uh, the Minister of Interior ordered that 70 mosques get uh, checked, and that a year prior to that, the previous Minister of Interior said that they will crack down on mosques using all available legislation, be it fire protection, you know, health, you know, uh, uh, standards, etc., to shut them down. And on that very same day, the Minister of Interior was due to appear in court for his rape allegations and sexual harassment charges. So when you have a Minister of Interior mobilizing the coercive means of the state to uh, avoid going to, uh, to court, and on top of it, you have the president who wants to violate laicity by getting involved in clerical affairs and then create a problem when there is none. Yes, I mean, like you're going to lose the communities, and I think he already lost them. When you shut down two NGOs on accusations and refuse to take the matter to court, I'm sorry, the rule of law is, for, is, is gone. And today, Emmanuel Macron is actually creating a much bigger problem. Let's take the international perspective here. In Ifran, Nizan Massari, Associate Professor of International Studies, traditionally France has had a very good relationship, particularly when it comes to intelligence sharing with North African countries. Um, do you think that given Macron's language, Islam is in crisis around the world, uh, this crackdown on Muslims that he's doing, that international relations might be affected and therefore actually make things slightly more difficult when it comes to things like intelligence sharing? 
Uh, in general, generally speaking, in terms of international relations, I think that this can have an impact on uh, uh, Fran France's prestige around the world and uh, uh, throughout the Muslim world. And we saw this uh, with the different movements of boycotting French products. So we saw that in the reaction of some leaders, in particular Erdogan in, in Turkey. So this uh, this kind of attitude. Can uh, will certainly have an impact on French prestige as uh, terre d'accueil, as terre d'exil, uh, that uh, it has been cultivating for decades now, if not centuries. Um, in terms of uh, uh, intelligence sharing, um, I'm not sure this can uh, will have an impact. Uh, remember that uh, when uh, the, the the boycott of French products uh, or the call for boycotting French products uh, uh, took place, uh, the, the minister of uh, the French minister of uh, foreign affairs uh, came to Rabat and visited with his Moroccan colleague, and he said that in hard times uh, France looks for its friends. So. Uh, he was here asking for the, the, the Moroccan support uh, uh, for the French government to help France disentangle itself from this imbroglio in which it found itself uh, after those uh, declarations of Macron. Uh, so, uh, and in terms of, in so uh, this is to say that in terms of intelligence uh, sharing, this is uh, uh, this is how. Uh, Algeria and Morocco, in particular, deal with France and uh, cultivate their uh, close relationship with France. And this is how France appreciates uh, uh, the, the support of uh, its uh, of the uh, intelligence um, apparatus in these two countries, in these two Maghrebi countries. So I'm not to answer your question. I'm not sure this how will have an, any substantial impact on intelligence sharing. Uh, Philippe, it has already had an impact however, on domestic politics. Is this yet another example of the Le Penisation, I want to say, of French politics? The politics in France are being dragged to the right. I think probably yes, because look, we've got here a young president. He was 39 when he was elected in 2017. He was seen by many, uh, I think, to start with in the UK, where I live as a young modernizer, liberal, economically liberal, but also politically, culturally liberal. And on that side of the argument, clearly, that's not uh, what it turned out to be, frankly, because uh, by, first of all, appointing a number of hardliners uh, in the government currently, uh, people are pushing very hard forward the this sort of agenda of a criminalization of uh, people's uh, thoughts and opinions, because this is what it is in the end. Uh, when you don't break the law uh, in a democratic country, the role of a state, of any state, is not to request uh, its citizens to adhere to certain values. As long as you don't break the law, you should be free to live your life as you see fit. And that's why we, we're going down that route in France. And I think Macron clearly, and that's really what is quite fascinating, is not putting a halt to it. He's clearly seemed to be going along that. And how to explain that? Well, as a political scientist, I would say, well, probably, yes, there's, a, there's an election looming in two years' time. He wants to be reelected. And he sees, he looks around him, he says to his left, there's no real serious opponent. So he looks to his right, the main conservative the main conservative party, Les Républicains, is really in disarray. So what is his main opponent? Again, that's the far right and Marine Le Pen, like in 2017. So that's pr probably one reason as to why he thinks that he can gamble by outbidding Le Pen on her own traditional uh, themes and ideas. It is a very risky move because in politics, there's a law if you really ape your opponent's idea, if you triangulate those ideas, there's a risk that it would backfire because people, the voters, will think in the end, well, if he legit legitimates the ideas of, of his opponents, then probably let's vote for him or her because, you know, uh, if the opponents think the same, probably we should we should really support the people who uh, flagged up those those ideas in the first place. Yeah, sir, I see you shaking your head there at some of the comments that Philippe uh, was making, particularly when he described Macron as a liberal. Why, why were you shaking your head? 
Well, because we had the signals that Emmanuel Macron was not really reliable. He would he was everything and nothing at the same time. Uh, let's say, for example, the uh, the case of colonization. So he goes to Algeria and speaks of crimes against humanity. He catches heat from the language or from the right, and then backtracks and says the exact opposite. One day he would say we should stop with this uh, vengeful laicite targeting Muslims, and then he catches heat from you know the people around him, and they say no, we should have to we have to save Muslim women who can't wear lipstick during the month of Ramadan. So there has been a constant you know going left and right, try to please everyone which was a clear indication that Emmanuel Macron would be prone to being influenced by the people around him, that Emmanuel Macron, when he got elected, he did not get himself surrounded by advisors, let's say, from both camps. They were either from the hard right, you know, staunch, you know, neoliberals, or staunch secular fundamentalists from the left. As an example, his Minister of Education, Jean-Michel Blanquer, we don't know what he did for education in France, but what we know is he's waged war against Muslim women wearing a headscarf, Muslim girls wearing a, a long skirt, and his obsession with applying his version of laïcité. On top of it, if we speak of laïcité, for example, Emmanuel Macron did not stand with the official body uh, uh, that would support laïcité, the observatory of laïcité, but he stood silent when Jean-Michel Blanquer set up a bogus or like a, 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 an empty shell called the... Sorry Council. to disturb you here, Yasser. I just want to, I just want to ask you a question, uh, just picking up on one of those points. Is this, then an inbuilt xenophobic racist attitude that France has? Or is this Macron using this as a calculated political decision to gain popularity? Well, I think your, your question is right on point, and I was coming to it, is that we cannot say that this is only a political maneuver for Emmanuel Macron to be elected. There has been a 30-year-long movement to normalize far-right ideas that can go back to the years of François Mitterrand being in power, which means in the 1980s. So when we say that Emmanuel Macron does what I call Islamo-diversion, you avoid talking about you know, real problems, you create a Muslim pro problem to make a diversion with public opinion. No, I mean, like, you know, there are structural drivers for, for these moves, and that what was being preached by Jean-Marie Le Pen, the far-right leader, the historic you know, far-right figure in France in the 1980s, has been picked up by the mainstream right and the mainstream left. And today, Emmanuel Macron, and I agree with Mr. Marlier, that when he looks on the left, there is nobody really serious about it, which confirms the thesis that when you ape your opponent, you become like him, because the Socialist Party tried to apply right-wing you know, politics, they, they, they became instinct. And on the right side of Emmanuel Macron, well, he's got Marine Le Pen as most probably his opponent, which raises the question, where are France's, you know, uh, leftists, uh, liberals, and the people who stand with the human rights? As an example, if I may finish, sir, is that we have seen thousands of people marching against the global security bill last weekend, but we wouldn't see the same amount of people marching against the law on, on the separatisms that target Muslims, especially when the problematic Article 24 that prohibits filming the police may be removed from the security bill and inserted into the law of on against separatism, which specifically targets Muslims. Let's go back to the international uh, reaction here. Uh, Nizar Masari, we've seen this often within, let's say, religious communities of all hues, not just the Islam uh, community, in countries when they feel that they are under attack, they look for outside help. They look for other countries, other leaders to come and help them defend their case. In this case, we have a very outspoken, you touched upon this earlier, a very outspoken Erdogan of Turkey, uh, really pushing Macron and France quite hard. This kind of language, do you think it is useful coming from Turkey? Well, I'm not a specialist in Turkish politics, but uh, uh, I think that this also answers uh, Erdogan's uh, political domestic needs, and it helps him beef up his credentials uh, uh, internally in Turkey and also with uh, the wider Muslim community in which he wants to be considered or he aims at being considered uh, uh, a leader, uh, a leader at least among uh, a good part of the, the Muslim world. So uh, it serves it serves him, 
but uh, whether this uh, this is he is considered a leader of this kind of reaction is uh, what will help uh, the, uh, 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 control what or uh, tame what is happening in France. I'm, I'm not sure that that would be the case. I think that uh, as my two colleagues here, uh, I agree with the facts that this uh, this these moves uh, respond. Uh, these moves by Macron respond to uh, domestic French needs, and it's not uh, the answer um, of or the discourse of Erdogan that will uh, stop France from acting the way it wants to act. So, uh, Philippe, if this law is, if this bill is problematic and there are issues with it, is there a better way of dealing with this? What is the what is the alternative? I think, to be fair, the alternative now would be probably no bill at all. I think there is clearly, and I think uh, legal experts, uh, judges, uh, come forward in France in the debate and, and say, well, we've got already those laws. You know, if you if you want really to, to criminalize uh, online hate speech, we've got that. There's no need for further new law. And, and of course, yes, probably, so the answer would be no, no law. I think probably the France needs uh, appeasement. Uh, the president, to start with, should be really uh, addressing the whole nation, should be inclusive. And whereas this law probably is also helping feed a, a kind of a, a sort of a insidious uh, um, climate in which, you know, you tend to designate implicitly or explicitly uh, enemies within. Uh, enemies within, we uh, that was an expression coined in the UK by Margaret Thatcher in different circumstances. But we know what it means. When you start uh, flagging up enemies within, it's, it's very, very bad for the, for the cohesion of a nation. And that's probably we, we've reached that point in France where uh, people have to be very careful. So far, I think what is quite remarkable is that the population at large has reacted very well. Whenever there's a terrorist attack, uh, people are refrained. There's no... Um, in general, people behave. There's no, there's no temporary need for retaliation. But of course, if you have a government uh, showing this, what I, I believe is a very poor example, setting very poor example, of course, things could change in the end. So, and, and of course, if, if, uh, if the far right uh, would eventually uh, come to power, that would, of, of course, make, make things worse because we know the program of the far right. So I think to answer your question, no bill would probably be better. And what France needs at the moment, it seems to me, is appeasement, inclusivity, you know, inclusiveness, sorry. Sorry, we are running out of time and I would like to get to Yasser as well. Yasser, is there an alternative to this bill? No, I mean, like, you know, we have, this bill literally has to be dumped. The alternative would be to audit our counterterrorism and totally overhaul it and rethink how France deals with the terrorism by, by connecting the bombs it sends and sells abroad and the bombs it gets uh, at home. You can't be the, the promoter of the manufacturer of death and then expect flowers in return. So we really have to think about France's role abroad and why structurally 40 years of counterterrorism have been failures. And of course, you know, a discourse of appeasement would be welcome today. We have to remember people that a million people have Across the poverty line, and 50,000 people or most have died of COVID-19. And 2021 might be even worse than 2020. So, if Macron really cares about his country, he should actually bring it together and not divide it further. Uh, so, let me finish with Nizar in Ifran. Nizar, is there any way, any form of law that you've seen internationally that has dealt with this accusation that it's the nation's values are under attack by a religious community? I think that. Uh... The, what France needs uh, is to to look at other examples. Uh, I w what comes to my mind immediately is uh, how India, for instance, not current day India, but India uh, post independence dealt with the issue of secularism. Uh, the secularism that is uh, truly accepts the diversity of religions rather than uh, uh, separates religion from public run. Thank you all. Our guests, uh, Yasser Louati, Philip Mayer and Nizar Massari.
And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the entire team here in Doha, bye for now.